Our fight to eradicate corruption, maladministration, unethical leaders, and the abuse of taxpayers' money by those in power continues. It's fresh, it's fearless, and focused. The Outer Hour, where your voice matters. Car Powership South Africa was named one of the preferred bidders of the RMI PPP Emergency Power Plan. The proposed project would have been one of Car Powership's biggest projects at 1,220 megawatts. Three power ships are planned to be anchored in the Kucha, Richards Bay, and Saldana Bay harbors. Car power ship was denied environmental authorization from the DFFE. The CSIR estimates the project could cost South Africa between 160 and 218 billion rand. Outer's energy advisor Chris Yelland has highlighted the risk of higher gas prices that could put the generation of power at 5 rand per kilowatt hour, compared to the bid prices of 1 rand 50. Car Powership failed to get water licenses, port authorization, and waste management licenses. Outer believes that NERSA has failed to apply its mind to the circumstances and is taking NERSA to court. But wait, as they say in the classics, there's more. There's a whole lot more to the car power ship story than the snapshot I've just given you. Welcome to the Outer Hour. I'm Tom London with you for the next 60 minutes. CEO of Outer, Wayne Divinage, Stefani Fick and Brendan Slade join us on the show this evening to unpack Outer's latest legal challenge. Let's say good evening. Before we say hello to you, and we'll catch up with viewers' comments in just a moment and the hellos that we always uh, put on screen. We'll do that in just a moment. We'd like to say hello to our viewers on YouTube this evening. If you're watching for the first time, pop a hello into the comment section. First time viewers in the Facebook page, pop a hello into the comment section. Masekho Mutsuneng will be handling the comments this evening. Well, let's cross to Wayne Divinage's studio or uh, office at home and say good evening to the CEO of Outer. How's it, Wayne? And uh, a big day for Outer today. Could you just take us back, if you don't mind, for viewers who haven't watched the show before or people who are unfamiliar with the Car Power Ship story, what is Car Power Ship and how did Car Power Ship land up with such a huge contract? You know, I'm going to leave that to either Brendan or Stefani because they've they've been working on this project for some time. They'll, they'll be able to give a lot better insight to the question. Sure. I just want to say this, that, um, you know, when we get to litigation in a matter, in a project, it's, it's, it's because we've gone through a thorough five-step methodology process after investigating, after working with researchers, unpacking the facts and the issues, uh, and then engaging with the authorities. And in this case, we, 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 we replied to their uh, call for public comments. Uh, they were very flippant about their response and didn't cover uh, the issues that we needed to hear uh, responses from. So after we engage, um, which is our second uh, step in our methodology, which gives them opportunity to explain themselves, we, uh, we then um, expose the issue, we drive the narrative, we then mobilize if need be, we call protest action, we get other entities on board with this case. And the last step, only if it's necessary and if it's substantive, do we decide on litigation? Uh, so out of the hundreds of projects we've done, a number of them reach the stage. These are big milestones. Uh, and in this case, government and people on the other side uh, uh, people connected to this deal were going to become very, very rich uh, uh, on citizens of this uh, of this country. So, it, it is extremely irrational, uh, and uh, and so we we were within the deadlines that are required of us in administrative law to lay this uh, charge or this this claim this this case and file our papers this week. A big day as we announced it to the media and society, but a big week of very hard work putting the final touches to the affidavit amazing energy with this team and this organization 
uh, yeah, it's a proud uh, moment. Let's see what happens going forward, but very necessary that we brought this action. And we're going to tell you more about it tonight. So we're all on a high at the moment, Tom. Well, let's ask Stefani Fick uh, about the background to this case. Uh, just give us an update, uh, Stefani. G- get us up to date uh, and to the point that things started worrying outer when it comes to car power ship. Yes. Um, so there was a whole bidding process and they obviously won the, the, the bid. Now, um, um, yeah, let me try and get this um, correctly because, as for, you know, it started, um, uh, you know, last year already with the fact that um, in terms of the risk mitigation, independent power producer program, if I'm correct, Brendan can, can can help me there, they made available 2,000 megawatts to be, um, you know, for, for, for bidders to bid for, um, or ma- because we, we need different um, power producers on, on, on the grid, as we all know that um, ESCOM is, is struggling. So they, they won the bid. But then, you know, after they won the bid, um, there's quite a few hoops that they needed to jump through. And and, and, and the first um, problem in this whole um, debacle was the um, environmental authorization. So they need to get authorizations to park their boats in our harbors. Um, It's three harbors, um, Cougar, Soldana and Richards Bay. And apparently they asked for exemption um, and they got it. But then the Department of Forest, Fisheries and Environmental Affairs um, realized that there was problems and they withdraw their um, exemption um, and said that they got the exemption on um, uh, the wrong facts. That, in fact, is being investigated currently as we speak. Um, They then applied for uh, the normal way for um, environmental authorizations and they were denied. Now, this is, um, um, I think people will remember, this is the whole thing about, you know, they're sitting in in, in the harbors, is it safe for for the fish, you know, uh, pollution and and, and all of that. Um, So they were denied that authorization and now they are appealing. Um, Now, despite all of that, so, you know, a lot of dictates, um, objectively, you will think, but what is the chances of them getting an environmental mm. authorization? Mm. And then there's so many other things that they still need to get. They need to uh, make financial closure, which has been postponed so many times. So despite the fact that they sell this as, um, you know, emergency procurement, um, you know, it's been postponed so many times, the power purchase agreements um, always also seems to be a problem because if you really look at um, this whole deal and the fact that it's for 20 years and it doesn't make sense, um, car power ship was not supposed to be, you know, a, 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 a 20 year solution. It was only supposed to be temporary in cases where there's, for example, um, disasters. Um, but government decided that this is a, is a, is a good plan and it's going to cost this country an enormous amount of money. And despite all of that, NURSA, when they looked at all these facts, still decided that it was a good idea to give them generation licenses. Um, and this is a problem for us because we, we do think that, um, you know, the decision by NURSA was irrational. NURSA should look at all the facts and come to a reasonable reasonable decision and we really believe that they did not apply their mind that any reasonable person looking at exactly the same facts will come to a different conclusion and here we are because despite the you know someone asked me but you know then they're not going to get the environmental authorization so why are we Mm. pursuing this case you know except for the fact that it's the right thing to do um i also believe that it's in, in in principle important um, you know, to, to ask the court to intervene because NURSA has got a mandate. NURSA has got a duty towards South Africans. And they can't just brush aside saying, you know, it's policy decisions. When these types of um, decisions, they need to apply their mind to because they are the national energy regulator. We expect more of them. Got it. We'll get more details as we go through the show from Advocate Stefani Fick. And uh, I'll pose a question to Brendan Slade, our legal uh, project manager, in just a moment and ask him what Car Power Ship is. What, who is this company? Who are these people? But before we do that, let me say hello to a first-time viewer on our YouTube channels, Pew Seller. 
How's it, Spiwe? Good to have you with us. Your first time watching the show. I hope you engage with us and spend many more Outer Hours with the team. Rudy Heineke is on board. You know him from Outer Hour. He says, good evening, Alterians. Devaney Davids, the show's producer, is on board as well. We have Wayne Duvenage in the room. You're welcome to interact with Wayne uh, in the comment section. You can pose questions in the comment section. We'll put them to Wayne on screen if you like. And then we have got Clive Beckett, who wants to know who's in jail for corruption recently, lad. Uh, that is a question that Clive brings up every week. Rightly so. Uh, we are waiting for those orange overalls, aren't we? Frustrating too. Ian Paulson says, good evening all. Hello, Ian. Good to have you with us. We'll do one or two more quickly. Uh, Madeline Gooch is saying hello to Sylvia, and that's nice. Say hello to each other and make friends in the comment section. We are a community, aren't we, of active citizens. And let's take one or two more. Brent Whitehorn says hello. And Philippe Lionette says the ship is already in South African waters. I saw one leaving Durban Harbor a few days ago early in the morning. And Desmond Van Breda says, good evening, guys. Now, the comment section is there for you to engage with the participants on the show. They're in the comment section, so you can chat to Stefani, Brendan, or Wayne during the show. If you've got questions that you'd like me to put to one of our contributors, then pop those questions in the comment section down below this video. And you can also chat to each other. So you can do a heck of a lot in that comment section. And if you haven't, please like and share the program. That's how we get the message out to more and more viewers on Facebook. Now, Brendan, what is car powership? Who is car powership? What are they designed to do and why are they in our country? Thanks, Tom. To put it lightly, car powership is supposed to be a temporary solution. So how it usually works in the international sphere is um, a car powership project usually has three ships. So there's one barge ship that brings in the gas that's imported. And from that ship, it goes over to the regasification ship. And from the regasification ship, there is a, a connection running to the actual car power or the power ship generation. That's the ship in the middle where the power is generated. From that specific ship, it then goes over to a shore or a port terminal. It's much like a plug and play situation. So the problem we are seeing here is the country wants to enter into a 20 year contract with car power ship. Mm -hmm. How it usually happens is these this type of technology gets utilized in areas struck by natural disasters. So if there is a typhoon in, in Indonesia, for example, a car power ship would, would dock in, in the Indonesian ports and they would supply the power for the period which during which the government cannot produce power. So it, it's it's literally like a backup generator for for emergency purposes, and unfortunately, we are being confronted with this being brought as a permanent solution to to ever ever changing load shedding, which unfortunately will not go go away. And if I can just add to to the load shedding notion is um, yes, to understand this in context, ESCOM has a generation capacity of forty four gigawatts of of electricity. The tender amount, which Stefani spoke about earlier, amounts to 2,000 megawatts or 2 gigawatts. Car PowerShip out of that bid won 1,200 megawatts worth of power. So if, if you consider it in the greater scheme of, the, of things, yes, it is certainly power that we need, but car PowerShip will not plug that gap in the long term. By taking away car power ships generation licenses does not mean that the independent power producers whose programs are already running will be halted. Those will continue as it is. But unfortunately, the government is pursuing car power ship, notwithstanding the fact that they could actually connect additional renewable energy in the place of car power ship. Wayne, uh, w was Car Power Ship, you know, th the only bidder that made sense? Was Car Power Ship the best solution to emergency power problems, in your opinion? No, not at all. They were part of a whole consortium of different, uh, not a consortium, but there were a number of bidders uh, that that put forward this, uh, their solutions to the uh, emergency power requirements as per the RMI, PPPP, lots of P's in there. Um, they were looking, government's looking for 2,000 megawatts. 
and and as Brendan says, you know, this is a this is a, a, a risk mitigation program in this tight time that we find ourselves in, while government gets uh, its longer term energy requirements in place, uh, and and quite frankly. You know, renewables running currently between five and six, I think maybe 7% of our total energy production in this country, where many countries around the world, in Europe especially, uh, some of them are running well over 50%. So we're a long way off. And uh, our, our um, consultants, our specialists have given input and we'll be exposing a lot more about this later on to show that had renewables uh, been bought in, and a number of them, and additional ones that were were not uh, bought into the R, uh, the, the the risk mitigation program, uh, being able to come on board, and it's not it's not very long to it doesn't take uh, too long to get them up and running. Um, we would have had far less hours of uh, of of load shedding in the last year. So it's good to have our input and research backed by uh, these specialists who do the modeling. Uh, and, and and to really denounce these claims of base load, uh, of course, base load is an issue, uh, but the extent of that, what is required. So there were others. Uh, I think Brendan has uh, had done some good research there and Stefani on, on who they were, but certainly Chris Yelland would have given us uh, uh, some input. He's also one of our advisors, and we've heard very often in the past uh, that this they could really have left car power ships out and replaced them with other much lower cost bidders and much quicker than what car power ships is. Is that what you see when you take a look at the bid, Brendan, that the car power ship deal doesn't make sense? It's a whole lot more expensive? It's absolutely a whole lot more expensive, but it's also government dealing with an international company uh, south africa or south african private company only has 49 percent stake in this particular company the rest is owned by by a turkish company so I, I i don't see the reasoning behind contracting with somebody like that where's where's the local employment that we aren't addressing stimulating the economy on a local level we're just enriching private entities on an, on an international scale. Talking about a local level, how does the car power ship deal affect the public? I mean, South Africa broadly, but also the local communities in and around these ports we've spoken about. Well, obviously, it will. If 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 it takes off, it will have a significant impact on the marine life. The water is is heated up. Uh, th th there's a lot of vibration through through the whole process of generation. So research also has shown that some coral reefs would not withstand something like that. But luckily, we do not have a, co a coral reef such as the Great Barrier Reef. But nevertheless, um, it's, it's still up to us as South Africans to protect our shorelines. And I don't want to go into the discussion of... of uh, oil exploration, which we have seen recently of, mm. of, of Shell, but uh, yes, no, that that will definitely affect us. But on a on a on a level that will affect the purse, um, somebody needs to pay for it. And if it runs for twenty odd years, we estimate that that will cost the country around two hundred odd billion rand. And uh, wh where do you think that will come from? Obviously, from from the taxpayer and the electricity consumer. So. That that needs to be that bill needs to be fitted, and the only reasonable means for government to to fit that bill is just to apply that to the additional electricity tariff. So we will see heightened tariffs um, in the in the form of household consumption tariffs uh, if if this deal goes goes ahead. Stefani, um, Brendan's talking about the impact on our economy and the price that we're going to land up paying. We've seen these projects before, seen them in energy generation and with our roads, where we get a price at the beginning of the project. And by the time the project overruns two or three times, uh, the price we actually pay is in multiples of fives and tens of the original prices. Is that a danger here? Yes, I mean, uh, you know, if, if, if ESCOM had to ask that they be indemnified against, you know, um, um, 
costs and whatever in this deal, when they sign the power purchase agreement, you must know that there is some way something is, is not lacking. Just but explain think, that to us. What did Eskom uh, in, in indemnify themselves from? Well, I think it, the PFM, you, you see, there's certain regulations and acts and legislation that they have to abide by. Now, when um, the, uh, you know, the minister said that they can procure um, uh, 2,000 megawatts and that ESCOM will buy the power um, um, So, in, in terms of power purchase agreements. Um, and I, I think the problem, and, and, and this might be a bit of speculation, but it, it, it makes sense, is that financially this deal doesn't make sense. We sit with ESCOM that is struggling. They've got um, all power stations. Um, you know, they need to move um, on, on, on the fact that, you know, they need to move away from, from coal um, and they need alternatives. And, and I think ESCOM realises that car power ship are not it. There's, um, you know, I am, I, I, I'm not a, a big enough expert to say, yes, it should be solar. What I can say and what makes sense to me is that it should be a combination of some of the, you know, the, the, the greener electricity and so forth in order to substitute the coal as they work that out. And I, and I think that um, whether the department, whether there is corruption, and let me just say, we don't necessarily have proof of corruption. I mean, DNG, the, the, the bidder that lost the bid, um, is taking nurse uh, is taking the department and car power ship to court because mm. they allege that there was corruption. But there's just something about this that doesn't sit right with 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 one. If you look at all the circumstances, all the prevailing evidence, you know, stuff that's made public and and, and all of that. Why are they pushing so hard for for this car power ship deal? Is it with the 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 um, um, the ownership of, you know, Car Powership SA is the sole um, owner of Car Powership Cougar, you know, the the the, the three mm -hmm. um, harbors where the ships are going to sit. Um, and then 51% belongs to this, this Turkish company. But who then makes up that 49% that owes um, um, the rest? And where's the money going to? I mean, I just today read an old article. I think it's a 2021 article that said that some of the, the, the people, companies involved um, have not been part of the energy sector. So yet again, it sort of streams of, but something is wrong and that this deal is not in the best interest of South Africa. And it appears that despite, um, you know, um, being reasonable and realistic, is that I think government is again showing that, you know, they have a policy and they're going to go for it, um, irrespective of whether it's in the best interest. Um, with regards to the the, the money, and, 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 and sorry, I'll stop talking just now. I'm just looking for the, because... Um, we do want to know about media, the money, yes. <laughs> yeah, our media people has put it so nicely in, in, in the report. So, yeah. Um, uh, you know, the car power ship bid price in April 2020 was about 1 rand 50 per kilowatt hour. Nurses said this would be by now be up to 2 rand 80 per kilowatt hour. But our independent consultant estimates the current price is close to 5 rand per kilowatt hour. This is roughly two to three times the cost of alternative generation um, methods. So it, it also goes uh, goes to the fact that, and I'm reading again from this lovely media release, that the car power prices will be affected by the US dollar and the rand exchange rate and the inter international price of gas, which NERSA did not address. This may come as tremendous cost for the public. So what it tells you is that we don't know what will this end up costing us mm. because if you look at the reasons, everything is redacted. You don't really know. And that is um, a part, also part of the reasons why we are on this, this path so that there can be transparency. And that if, if again, if, if, if NERSA can't apply their mind, we need assistance of a court to tell them, but, you know, set aside your decision because it's not rationally linked to the evidence before you. Wayne, uh, is, you know, could the reason for, Getting this deal done not be that you can just pull these ships into harbors, plug them into the grid, and uh, bang, you've got power, and a lot of the problems are sorted. I mean, that's the that's the picture that's been painted. 
Yeah, but it's not the case, really. It doesn't uh, happen overnight. Uh, you know, if if this was all given the go ahead right now, uh, we estimate, and the experts tell us, it's it's a year to year and a half, maybe even two years before energy is being generated. It's not like the ship just pulls in tomorrow. There's a lot of infrastructure that has to be put in place, uh, and it's, uh, it's it takes a while. And there's other, uh, um, you know, and, and that, that's another big factor in this case, is that 200 billion rand roughly over 20 years, and it's gone. All that infrastructure we paid for, it leaves our shores. Whereas if you invest in local energy production, put up the wind plants and the solar, that stays here, creates jobs. And by the way, our, our, our experts also tell us that there are more jobs created per kilowatt hour in renewable energy than from car power ships. So um, all, these, all these issues, you know, they, they, they try and paint this picture that uh, – that you know, load shedding is, is is almost something we must pay any price for to 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 try and mitigate, uh, and and that's really uh, it's that's misinformation and, mm. and that's disingenuous to put it in that area. Of course, we don't want load shedding, but this is not the solution. We can tell you that right now, and it by far is the most costly solution. So uh, and, you know, today on Power FM, just chatting, there was another energy expert. I mean, Chris Hill, and there's a, quite a few of them out there, but it wasn't Chris. Now, I'll get the gentleman's name, just really uh, supported our view, uh, just saying, absolutely, this this was the one of the worst deals. It's like that nuclear deal that civil society, uh, Earth Life Africa and SAFSI stopped uh, a couple of years ago. It was just the wrong decision. This is in the similar uh, vein, just the wrong decision for this country. We do not need it. It stinks, uh, you know, the old saying, if it looks like a rat and walks like a rat, it's a rat. This is a rat of a deal as far as we're concerned and it must be stopped i think what stands out for me and i guess many people watching the show tonight is this um, uncertainty over the actual cost or price of the project and as stefani mentioned it's linked to rand dollar exchange rates and international mm -hmm. gas prices well we know which way the rand dollar exchange rate has been going for some time we also know that there's there's a lot of pressure when it comes to gas supply in the world with what's going on in uh, Ukraine and Russia, and it, it doesn't look like gas prices are coming down anytime soon. Is this one of those situations where we, can, where as the public, we can get told it's going to cost a hundred billion, and then in five years from now find out that it's half a trillion? Yeah, and that's what happened with with uh, nuclear. They come in at these ridiculously low. Prices and once you go through it all, you find out it's double the price. A absolutely. And even before the Ukraine war was around, gas prices were going through the roof. Fossil fuel prices were, were, were escalating uh, massively. So now there's a whole new dynamic with, 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 with no more gas coming out of Russia and, and all these other factors that are geopolitical influences. Mm. You want to have your infrastructure of energy production as much embedded into the system as you can get and generate from, from your own country within your shores. You've got a lot of sunlight, a lot of wind, use it. If you've got a lot of coal, as we have done in the past, use that. You know, to think that we can just plug gas in, we, the infrastructure to get gas here, besides these ships, there isn't any. You know, it's not like uh, uh, we are on a, on a, on a, in Angola or Nigeria or Mozambique, and even there it's underdeveloped. So, so we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that we build infrastructure and, 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 and beneficiate the resources that we have as best we can. And then obviously look to su su supplementing it in other areas and other ways. So it's a, you know, our independent, uh, our, sorry, our integrated resource plan, uh, it needs more updating, more regular updating. It hasn't been updated for some time now. Uh, and government is remiss. They are missing in action when it comes to being transparent, keeping the public involved and up to speed with what our future uh, energy uh, uh, development plan is all about. And that's why they're able to slip these things in and come with this notion that this is urgent, this is very necessary, and then urgent, 20 years. Ah, this, is, this is madness. 
We'll take a look at what Outer's concerns are and what Outer has asked the courts to review and set aside when it comes to this uh, approval in just a moment. But let's take a look at the comments coming in from viewers. I mean, Claire Feldman says, once again, not enough due diligence done by government. Let's ask Brendan Slade to comment on that comment by Claire Feldman. Do you believe there was enough due diligence done, Brendan? No due diligence and uh, something that stood out for us when we read nurses' reasons is nurse had a particular concern for car power ship's financial situation. So what they said in their reasons was that if they were not to grant the, the generation licenses, it would be detrimental for car power ship. So then you ask yourself as a South African citizen, how can somebody like NERSA, who's the energy regulator, put the interest of a Turkish company, if, if I may, before that of the public interest? That just so shows us one part of, of, of the whole process. Mm. The other thing, as far as diligence is concerned, a lot of the information that ought to have been made available to the public was simply not available to the public at the time. With what is more concerning, that outstanding information was also not made available to NERSA at the time of the decision. So that makes the whole process even more irrational. Stefani, uh, Andre Jennings says shortcuts were taken. I mean, Brenda's just spoken about the lack of public participation or information in the public participation process. Uh, do you believe shortcuts were taken and what kind of shortcuts uh, were taken? Sure. Um. I think this is now it all it, it, it all all is sort of linked to the question was there corruption is there some you know are there shenanigans going on um sometimes one can think what you want you can't always say this and and as outer we don't necessarily have um evidence of corruption per se but did we take shortcuts i think um that you can deduct that from the fact that they have information in front of them that they either ignored um, or decided it doesn't matter for whatever reason and then decided to give the car um, power ship IPPs the generation license is a good idea. Now, um, you know, the worst case scenario is that everyone is on this bandwagon, everyone is getting something just so that they can make this decision. Don't know. But you know what worries me is that the first thought in everyone's mind is, is it corruption? You know, who is benefiting from, from all of this? And this is to the level that the, the trust in, 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 in government has um, fallen to. And it is, it is ugh, we can't function like that. We need to trust government to act in our best interest, that they will use our money, taxpayers' money, to the to the uh, in the best interest of everybody, um, and that every time that there's a deal, I mean, it's the same. It is actually it's a joke to think that there's three hundred, was it billion or million rand going to KwaZulu Natal? There was a disaster. Um, this is just after all the riots. Um, the infrastructure due to um, um, corruption is falling apart. Don't know how much it really will cost to get KwaZulu Natal up to um, mm. um, the standard that that it, it should be, so that you know trucks can just get to the harbour. Um, and uh, you know, the first thing is there's a there's a, 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 the solidarity fund is going to look after this money just to make sure that you know uh, the the money is not stolen. I mean, honestly, we need to really start. We need to eradicate corruption because I think, um, you know, the science has been there for, for quite some time, but I think we can really now see the effects of corruption. Um, the fact that we are struggling um, to, 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 to build schools for our children, our health um, department is, is, is falling apart, everything is falling apart, and then the um, government wants to go spend 200 billion rand on a project that should not happen. Um, and we need to fix that. 
because um, because of government's irrational decisions, this is where they put um, their citizens. I mean, I mean, it's not lack to fight about uh, uh, fight w- with government of um, you know around every corner. Mm. Um, it is about you know we need to get the ship on the, on the right track, and we are there to help. I think, uh, despite everything that's happening in the country today, I think the majority of people would not mind helping that we can get. Um, you know, the country in, in, in the right direction. And um, it was so shortcuts taken. I don't know. All I can say is that we really believe that NERSA did not apply their minds when they made this decision. I'm going to ask you why you believe that in just a, a few minutes. But let me uh, look at some, I'm loving some of the comments coming in here, right? Johan Elof says, and he seems to know a little bit about nuclear power. Johan Elof says, those next generation Rolls Royce small nuclear plants look like the f- future solution. They're about 1.8 billion pounds each, so about 40 billion, pound, 40 billion rand for an entire nuclear plant. We'll, we'll talk about solutions and, and, and what the alternatives are in, in a moment. Uh, but let me ask um, Wayne. Uh, mm. w- w- you spoke about Outer's methodology a little earlier, Wayne, and mm. that the last step in Outer's methodology is legal action. Has mm. Outer tried everything it can before it's landed at the steps of the court? Yeah, yeah. Just to just to give some comment quickly on the comment you made uh, with with one of the viewers. Um, yeah, maybe maybe small modular nuclear plants is part of the equation. 40 billion rand um, per plant might not sound a lot, but it all depends on what the output is. You know, if it's um, if it's if it's 4,000 kilowatt hours, it's a different story. Or, or I mean, not kilowatt hours, or megawatts, or or um, 2,000. You got to you got to know what that output is. Uh, and we've never said no to 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 factors such as uh, a nuclear, other than to understand. We really need to understand. All the factors, the costs, the maintenance, the long-term uh, waste management costs. Uh, there's so many factors that have to be put in uh, uh, to all of these deals, and then, and then obviously we've got to make sure that they, they're as corrupt. Well, as Wayne, it, it leads into what Johan puts into his next comment, which is, and he's suggesting if you do car power ship one at a time and gradually scale up. Uh, each one can give us 600 megawatts, which would make a huge difference. Is there a better strategy when it comes to dealing with emergency power and these power ships, or, or should they just be sent home for good? You know, Tom, if these car power ships was one and then two, and they were gone in two years or three years as we as we were getting over the whole pressure on our system, that makes a totally different story from what we're dealing with right now. But to sign all three for a 20-year program, that's not risk mitigation, first of all. And even in the ones or twos or threes over very short periods of time, one still needs to factor in the costs, the environmental matters, the approvals of environmental matters. So none of that stuff just goes away. But it makes starts to make a little bit more sense if we are if it is going to do what it is mitigate the risk of low of, of, of massive load shedding in this country. That's clearly not what's happened in in this current deal that the license were granted by uh, by NERSA. So uh, yeah, good points made, but everything has to be looked at uh, within the context of the plans that are approved. Uh, and this one, as I said, is is a no no. So yeah, and to answer your question, Tom. Um, we, you know, not all our projects get to litigation because very often uh, in the first stage of investigation, we don't find enough evidence, we don't find enough substantiveness, or, or, or uh, and the research doesn't show e- exactly that there is a, a problem here. And so it might not even make the first hurdle. Those that get through the first hurdle from whistleblowers and research and, 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 and specialist input, and it is substantive, it is within our mandate, it, this is something that we have to tackle. We then um, pass through our project approval process that says, do we have the resources, first of all? And if this is something that has to go right to the end to court, are we prepared to go there? We've got to always answer that because we don't want to just expose. And then this is the methodology of many NGOs. They expose the issue, but they do not hold uh, the feet to the fire of those who have abused their authority. And we've got to go all the way. So 
So once it crosses that hurdle, then we give the powers that be the opportunity to explain themselves, possibly change their behavior. Maybe we've got it wrong. So we engage with the powers. And sometimes projects have got there and there has been a change in behavior. There has been a commitment uh, to rectify the situation. And, and that's where the project might stop. If they ignore us or they don't answer us or they give us a, 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 a you know, story that just really tries to fob us off, then we go into exposure. Uh, we, we formulate the narrative. We get the uh, society and the authorities and all stakeholders aware of what our concerns are. That sometimes bring about change. And then we, um, and then we mobilize protests. You've seen Ali and, mm. and, and we mobilize also by getting other oversight bodies involved to put pressure and then it's litigation. And we've gone through most of that process. We have to go through all those steps on this one. We've exhausted ourselves. Brendan and the team have made submissions to uh, NURSA, uh, very calculated submissions. We've we've had a good look at uh, uh, the argument that we have to present, uh, how they've broken the law, how they've fobbed society off, how they've ignored us. So, yeah, a lot of work has gone into it to get us to this stage. And uh, and this is so big and so substantive, we had no option but to go to court. And it's sad that you have to. And by the way, this is a multi-million rand court case. It's a big court case. Just the experts giving input in that. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of rands of modeling and uh, evaluation. And so, so um, you know, this is this is stuff that costs us. And we have to... We've got to now go and find the money for the, for this matter. We have a bit of a war chest which enables us to move fast, but we've got to keep building that up. So we are going to be appealing to the public. This is their case. We, uh, you know, again, we need to turn to our our supporters to get out there and get as many other people on board with these uh, small donations in our crowdfunding program, which helps us in the long run. So uh, a lot of work has gone into this case, and I must commend. Stefani and Brendan and the legal team and the communications team uh, who've done an outstanding job. The work put to get us to get us to where we are now, Tom, the work has been immense. It's been mm. draining. It's been exhausting and tiring. I see uh, Rudy Heineke has put a, an interesting uh, comment up. He's saying on a lighter note, Marcello Coco uh, today tweeted that for the first time, he fully supported Outer. It's an interesting one, huh? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> saw that. <laughs> no shame. Poor guy. He's, we are his enemy number one. Uh, he hates us. <laughs> and then today, today when somebody shared that tweet on our group, we all fell over. <laughs> Interesting times. Uh, okay, let's get to the case and let's get to the legal challenge uh, and ask Brendan Slade, uh, to, firstly, just to give us uh, an idea of what do you have a problem with when it comes to this nurse uh, approval, uh, Brendan, and, and the specifics when it comes to the case? I mean, what are you objecting to? Uh, just to put it in context, Tom, we just need to differentiate between the whole policy behind why we are talking about car powership and the role of nurse in getting car powership there. Mm -hmm. So just to go back in time a little bit, as Wayne also alluded to, we made submissions to nurse last year on the on the generation license application so those objectives which we we raised then included the objections that the environmental authorizations aren't there uh, the port permits are outstanding nurse did not take into consideration a lot of the financial implications so at that point in time we argued that the um the approval of the licenses were premature so then came 29th of, of October last year, um, NURSA approved the licenses. And that implies that all these hurdles that we told NURSA should first be adhered to, they, they, they still remained untouched. So on that basis, you can approach the court in terms of the promotion of Administrative Justice Act, because NURSA is an administrator in terms of that act to have their decision, which is an administrative decision, set aside. So our court application is, in essence, a judicial review application seeking to set aside the decision or the administrative decisions made by NURSA. And this is obviously based on the provisions of the Promotion of Administrative Justice Act, or PAJA, wherein we cited, amongst other things, NURSA did not apply its mind when it made the decision. NURSA did not 
take into consideration the relevant information at the time. NERSA took into consideration information that was irrelevant. So part of the information that was relevant at the time, which was not taken into consideration, is the mathematical calculations Stefani referred to earlier. So that was at the time when, when the bids went out, it was around um, 1 Rand 50, went up to 2 Rand 80, and according to the expert input we heard, it is now around 5 Rand. So that is some of the information which NERSA needs to take into consideration to say, okay, the decision I make now as the administrator is the right administrative decision because the right conclusion has been, has been reached. Um, if you can just give me a second, I can read out some of our specific grounds sure. for the review application. Uh, just by the way, the entire court application with the grounds for review has been uploaded to our website. So the viewers can just go onto our website and download it from there. <clears throat> uh, one of the additional um, grounds for judicial review was the absence of financial closure at the time. So as we have observed, Gwede Mantash and co has just extended the deadline for financial closure uh, around four times. So financial closure needs to happen before the agreement can, can, can be reached. Uh, that has happened four times, as I've pointed out. And then the, environment, the absence of the environmental um, authorizations by the Department of uh, Forest, Fisheries and the Environment. The absence of the Port Authority and the, uh, or the Port Authority permits. And at the time that the application was heard, there was also no evidence that ESCOM would enter into any power purchase agreements with car powership. So this is a very crucial aspect because in terms of the policy behind why we are talking about car powership, you recall we, we mentioned the 2000 megawatts. In that particular policy determination, it was stated that ESCOM should be the procurer, procurer mind me, or the buyer of the of the new generation capacity. So sure. it, it it was still completely in the dark. There was no indication that ESCOM would enter into such agreements. And without such an agreement, there would be no incentive for anybody to get a license in the first place. So talking about the power purchase agreements, uh, the, one of the main reasons we, we, we are taking on the generation licenses is because without any form of generation license, there is absolutely no way that a power purchase agreement can be enforced. So we are taking the ammunition away from, from the barrel of the gun before, before it's out. Stefani, I mean, I'm just listening to Brendan talk and I've been listening for the last 30, 40 minutes or so. And on the, you know, as an observer and on the surface, I look at it and go, well, hold on a moment. How does a project that didn't get the approvals that it needs from uh, departments and, 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 and regulatory bodies uh, that hasn't got a, a procurement agreement in place with Eskom? that um, that a lot of the information that was supposed to be included in the public participation process wasn't. With all of this in mind, how does an agreement like this take place? Hold on. Your guess is as good as mine. No idea. Mind-blowing. Why we have to go to court in order to, you know, to, to ask a court to assist by setting aside this decision. Mm. Because clearly, I mean, objectively, I mean, we uh, very difficult for, for us because we believe in our case. So anyone will say, you know, either they will, everyone is a critic. You know, it's our case. We're subjective. We, we are punting for, I don't know what, um, independent power producers, whatever the case may be. But what you cannot hide from or get away from is that objectively, you know, there's, there's something wrong, obviously something wrong. Now, someone actually asked the question, but if it's so clear that there's something wrong, why doesn't NERSA um, take back their decision? That's also a good question. You know, why don't they? Because in, in my view, they probably believe in the fact that they made the right decision. And if that is the case, then, um, like I've said previously, is that is also one of the reasons why we need this review application, because NERSA as a regulator has got a duty 
They've got a constitutional, well, in my view, I actually want to say a constitutional duty. Well, they have a constitutional duty to make proper and reasonable and just administrative decisions. Um, but they have a mandate in terms of legislation to, 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 to look at, you know, the infrastructure and the way um, um, electricity, you know, they are, for example, responsible to make sure that everyone has got access to electricity. So it, 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 they have a big responsibility. And if they are just going to rubber stamp these types of applications, um, you know, that's a sad day. But, Brendan, you didn't mention it to, um, um, this evening, but um, actually in, 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 in preparing for today, um, I read what you referred to, the fact that NERSA went to great lengths to actually say that if they don't give the generation licenses now to car power ship, that I show car power ship is, is, is going to lose money. Now, if you do the balancing act, what should weigh more? In, in general, what should weigh more? The interest of a, a company that, you know, 51% of, of the shareholding is sits in, a, in internationally, sits in another country, or should, should the fact, the interest of South Africans, the interest of your country weigh more? So um, it's all of that, that, that just, you know, actually I sometimes think they want me to pull my hair out because, you know, common sense, Mm. Um, um, does not always prevail. But you know what? On the other hand, this is what makes life exciting. We have a job to do. And sometimes I think government makes it easy because we need to rectify these things. And 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 and, and um, um, this decision was really not justified. Gives us an opportunity to work with great with a great legal team. Um, you know, may I use this opportunity to say thank you to to the attorneys a, a, again, to our advocates, to the marketing and comms department arranging the conference. It is just a pleasure um, to work with people with so many with so much energy. Tom, for tonight, you know that we can have after hour and have this discussion. So, yeah, there's always good with the bad. Wayne, this uh, reminds me of the early days of the Dudumieni battle, uh, and we know the outcome of that. She's no longer allowed to hold office in companies and organizations in this country. Alta was victorious in that battle. What do you hope happens here? Well, we hope that um, actually what we would hope for is for NERSA to read our papers and to acknowledge that they've got it wrong uh, and to not even challenge this court case and to make an announcement and a decision that uh, that that they are there's merit in what we're saying and that they're going to uh, agree with us in which the in which case maybe an order is given of the court that this takes place well that would be first place but knowing them knowing our government departments using our taxpayers money uh, because it's no skin off their nose, uh, they will have lawyers that um, that will convince them to fight this because they make a lot of money out of this. Mm. Uh, so it's going to be long, it's going to be protracted, it's going to be costly, and that's not going to be in car power ships' favour anyway because any more delays is probably going to be a problem for them. Nonetheless, um, we hope if, if, if anything comes of it, the court does order in our favor and sends NERSA back to the drawing board to do this properly, in which case, if they do apply their minds and take into account all these things that we've put forward, they will have no option but to say, all right, car power ships, sorry, but there's no, there's no role for you in this country because that's what the reality shows. Car power is out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. We'll be keeping you updated. You can be sure. Watch every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Uh, the Outer Hour, as we always do when it comes to Outer's Court Challenges, keep you, the Outer supporter and the South African taxpayer, uh, informed as to the progress. We'll keep you updated as we go along. You sp spoke about it. It would be nice to have an announcement from Nurse to say, OK, we got this wrong. We'll give it another try. Uh, speaking of announcements, the Transport Minister has been making some interesting announcements recently, Wayne. Yeah, you know, um, so so basically they've said, yeah, there's one thousand, there's one point three million motorists that uh, license have expired uh, and they're not in the system to be renewed, but there's no extension to the deadline. Now, you know, I think this deadline extension is, is an issue. I mean, at some stage you've got to stop, uh, but the reality is, 
if you have 1.3 million motorists with expired licenses, you, Minister Fikilem Belula, have a problem in this country. You have a problem. And it's not something you can just lay at the feet of, of the public, as he is doing when he says 25 to 30% of people have not, uh, you know, bothered to to uh, uh, rock up after booking uh, their, their slots. And again, that's their problem. If that's the case, how is that possible? We believe those slots are hijacked slots. Those slots are filled with facilitators who block them off and they haven't been able to sell them. And so it's not the public who didn't pitch up, it's the facilitators, which is, as far as I'm concerned, part of the corruption in this country that is um, feeding off the scheme and the system. So uh, let's see what happens. Um, we think there's a problem looming uh, because this, this creates anxiety in a country. This is not good for people in any country. These are fines coming. These are traffic, there are going to be traffic officers that are going to really enjoy this situation and position. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's not a pleasant one. So, so we'll be talking more about that next uh, next week, I think, because there's other things that are unfolding around that, including roadblocks, including the way uh, the authorities are handling this matter. We've got some serious concerns. Is that another potential storm on the horizon? Yeah, no, definitely. And again, authorities getting it wrong uh, and not putting citizens at the core of their decisions and the way they behave. Uh, they, you know, this is abuse of authority, really. They do not engage enough with the, state, with the various stakeholders, including civil society. Uh, they need to start realizing that the answers will come from a collaborative approach, not from an approach of we are in power, we hold the positions of authority, and you must listen to us and you must do as we say. That's their behavior. They did that with ETOLs. They've done that with R2. They're doing it with car power ships. They're doing it with long distance tolling. Wherever we look, wherever we go uh, uh, to address issues, it's the same thing that, you know, because you're in authority, doesn't mean to say you have the answers and know everything. Uh, uh, you know, they really need engage, which is why we've got strong good laws around public engagement. Uh, but it doesn't help to ask the public to comment and then you ignore their comments. That's crazy. We'll be looking at the latest with the driver's license situation next week on The Outer Hour. In the final moments of the show, Brendan Slade, anything you want to add to the conversation as we wrap up this evening? I want to say thank you to all the supporters that keep supporting Outer. Let's keep on fighting the good fight together and donate if you can. Thank you. And Stefani Fick? It's always lucky to, 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 to um, be on the show and be joined by um, all the supporters and all the, 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 the questions and discussing matters that is very close to our hearts. It's really an honour um, to, to be a civil activist organisation, sort of fighting on behalf of our supporters and all the people out there, making sure um, that, you know, we create a really a better South Africa for all. Um, please support us. I mean, it, it, it really, um, we love the work that we do. And the more support we get, the more we can do and the more interesting um, conversations we can have on the show. So, but thank you very much. Have a good evening. And motorists, don't be extorted by outstanding funds. We'll talk about it next week. Uh, Wayne, uh, your final comments for our Outer Hour viewers and supporters this evening. I mean, it's, it's, it's the Outer Hour supporters donation that allows you to go on this legal fight, isn't it? Yeah, look, everything is about uh, we can only do with the resources that we have. Uh, and it's the funds that, uh, you know, we're a nonprofit organization. We had a good board meeting today, by the way, uh, the end of our last financial year wrapping up uh, things. We've got our AGM in a month's time. And um, and it was good to get the feedback from the board. They're really excited about, about what we are doing. And, and this is about uh, active citizenry that is has impact, that is effective, but we're only as effective as we can uh, employ the special people that we have, the uh, professionals uh, uh, that, that have to put these projects together. So, so it's really a, 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 an immensely motivating, uplifting experience working with this team, Tom. It's all I can say. And thanks to our supporters for your support. Uh, help us to get more, and we will do more, as Stefani says. And to you, Tom, thanks again for a good show.
Always uh, a pleasure being with the Outer team. Uh, look, you can go along to the website, outer.co.za. And if you haven't been to outer.coza, I, I recommend that you do. Because you get a great idea from the website what this organization is about. If you're new to the show, if you're new to Outer, do take a look at outer.coza. You'll find the projects are listed there. And as Brendan mentioned earlier, the details on this latest legal challenge will be on that website, outer.co.za. And most importantly, if you're not a supporter, donator to Outer, look for the Join Now button and become a contributor to the cause. I'd also like to tell you that uh, there was a press conference held at Outer's offices today that is up on the internet it's on youtube the link has been posted in the comments section down below this video by masejo and the podcast uh, that has been put together that really unpacks this story when it comes to car powership is also available on iona.fm the details are in the comment section below the video so if you'd like to know more if you'd like to scratch below the surface on this topic there's a whole lot of material for you that outer has produced look for the links in the comment section down below this video and go to the website outer.co.za well, this show flew by tonight. I hope you enjoyed it. I see some lovely comments coming in uh, for, on the comment section. Uh, wow, here's, let's end it with this one. Spiwe Selo, we'll make yours the last comment of the evening. Uh, and I think we started the show, one of the first comments we got was from Spiwe saying, from today, I'm a diehard supporter of Outer. Thank you for an eye-opening show. Spiwe, thank you for joining us on the show. Thanks for engaging with us. Thanks for commenting in the comment section. Thanks for being part of the show. You know, we don't always agree on topics. We're watching Johan Ilov saying, go for nuclear. And somebody else would say, no, let's go for renewables. And that's what effective dialogue and debate is about. And we have lots of it on the show. And, and, and most of all, uh, the outer team informs you as a South African citizen. Uh, it lifts the lid, lifts the veil on, uh, as Wayne said earlier, if it stinks, if it, you know, if it walks like a rat, it smells like a rat, it talks like a rat. Well, we lift the covers on that so that you can see as a South African beyond the sensational headlines. What is going on when it comes to car powership? What's going on when it comes to driver's license extensions? What's going on? And there are many, many more issues. We take a look at the Milton Lagoon issue. We're constantly on the case of the city of Cape Town. What's happening with the water in the Milton Lagoon? How are we going to clean our rivers? How are we going to deal with sanitation in this country? Outer has positions and projects on all of it. And uh, it's a pleasure to sit here and present them to you as part of the broadcast team. So thank you, Spiwe, and thank you to you wherever you may be for joining us on the outer hour remember you can watch this program at your leisure whenever you like so you don't always have to join us live it's on the outer facebook page and youtube channel every single week uh, and we'll catch you again live next wednesday 7 p.m we're talking about driver's licenses something has to be done join us then until then i'm tom london and i miss Our you already. fight to eradicate corruption maladministration unethical leaders and the abuse of taxpayers money by those in power continues it's fresh it's fearless and focused the outer hour where your voice matters <laughs>